Hello, my name is Robert. Welcome back to everybody who's been following our videos. I'm excited to say that we're going to finally live up to our name. The name of the site is called Revealing Revelation. And so far, really haven't gotten into Revelation. We had to do a bunch of kind of preemptive work to pave the way for it. But today, we start our journey, kind of. Uh, what we're actually going to do, we're going to look at a couple groups that are really important to the book of Revelation. We're going to first look at the demonic kingdom. And secondly, we're going to look at the angelic kingdom. We're going to look at the seven leaders on both sides. And that's really important to do because when we go through and we look at the book of Revelation, it's important to know who the principal characters are before we go into it. All right. And another thing to recognize is that when we first started this, we, we talked about the book of Revelation and the fact that it's seen as a bunch of just wild, fantastic creatures and dragons and beasts coming up out of the sea and angels flying in the sun. It's all great stuff. And yet Jesus said that the actual tribulation, the actual events that those images are meant to represent, it's going to be same old, same old. It's going to be life is normal. People are going to be getting married. They're going to be working, things like that. So we have to find out how do we figure this out? And the principles that we've looked at is that the answers to uh, scripture's mysteries, the answers to scriptural uh, prophecy lie in the Old Testament. They lie with the, the prophets and with the law. So we're going to stick to that. We're going to go back and find the answer. So when it's talking about the dragon, then scripture should tell us who the dragon is. When we're talking about the seventh angel or the beast from the sea, scripture should tell us specifically who those people are. So that's the way we're going to approach this. That's what we're going to do. So let's get started. Okay, so as I said, we're going to start with the demonic kingdom. And when you look at the, the rest of our plan, we're going to look at the demonic kingdom. Then we're going to look at the seven angels of power. And from there, we're going to start actually getting into Revelation 1.1. 1, 1. And like I said, when we uh, talked before, we're going to follow the timeline from beginning to end when it comes to the book of Revelation. But the way that the book is written, there is a lot of back and forth uh, concerning time as we go through and read it. Now, the arrow of time still keeps moving forward, but along the way, it's going to ebb and flow back and forth. So because of that, instead of just going through chapter by chapter, verse by verse, we're also going to thematically group some chapters while still staying true to that principle of going from beginning to end. So the first group we're looking at is actually the, the most important players, or some of the most important players, some of the mysterious figures who we really need to figure out who they are before we go through and start looking at the verses and chapters. So we're going to start with the bad guys. They're, they're always fun to look at. And today we're going to look at the sea, the unholy trinity, and the dragon. So the image of the sea, it's synonymous with the demonic kingdom. And I'm going to make that statement, and then we're going to show scripturally why that's true. Revelation 22 says, And he laid hold of the dragon, the serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan. So again, scripture specifically tells us the answer to mysteries. Who is the devil? Or I'm sorry, who is the serpent? Who is the dragon? Well, it says specifically it's the devil and Satan. Isaiah 27 1 says, in that day, the Lord will punish Leviathan, the fleeing serpent, with his fierce and great and mighty sword, even Leviathan, the twisted serpent, and he will kill the dragon who lives in the sea. So we're looking at the devil, we're looking at Satan, and it says that his home or where he lives is in the sea. Now, do I think that that's a physical representation? Probably not. Okay, I can't say that specifically, uh, but... In terms of scripture, in terms of the way scripture portrays the demonic kingdom, that is the metaphor that scripture uses. It uses the sea, it uses water as a picture of the demonic kingdom. And the dragon, the devil, is the head of it. So what have we learned? The sea represents the kingdom of hell in scripture. Now, 
I don't think it would be fair to just take what I've said, um, you know, just based on that little bit of scripture we looked at. But I'm making a statement up front. So as we go through and see more scriptures, you're going to see how this applies. And then you can make your judgment about whether you think the sea represents the demonic kingdom or not. So the next piece to look at is a group called the Unholy Trinity. So just as we know of the Holy Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, and the Holy Spirit, there is a counterfeit to that in the demonic kingdom. So this is from Revelation 16, 13, and 14. And I saw coming out of the mouth of the dragon, and we know who that is, that's Lucifer, that's the devil, and out of the mouth of the beast, and we're going to see that the beast is referencing the beast from the sea in Revelation 13. And out of the mouth of the false prophet. And that comes from the second half of chapter 13 in Revelation. Out of those three come three unclean spirits, like frogs, for they are spirits of demons, performing signs which go out to the kings of the whole world, to gather them together for the war of the great day of God the Almighty. So specifically referencing Three beings specifically says that they are demonic spirits and their purpose, what they're doing is they're trying to deceive the entire world in the day of the Lord's return. Revelation 20.10 says, And the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are also, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. And very justly so. But the reason I brought this scripture up it again lists those three beings together. They're, they're always seen in unison and in harmony with each other. Zechariah 11.8 says, Then I annihilated the three shepherds in one month, for my soul was impatient with them, and their soul was weary of me. And if you look at the context of the verse, this is God speaking. So he's tired of these three. He's fed up with them. They have gotten on his last nerve. Then Nahum 2, 11 through 13 portrays them, again, the three of them, but as a different image. Where is the den of the lions and the feeding place of the young lions? Where the lion, lioness, and lion's cub prowled with nothing to disturb them. The lion tore enough for his cubs, killed enough for his lionesses, and filled his lairs with prey and his dens with torn flesh. Behold, I, again, this is God speaking, I am against you, declares the Lord of hosts. I will burn up her chariots in smoke. A sword will devour your young lions. I will cut off your prey from the land, and no longer will the voice of your messengers be heard. Now, physically, uh, this was, or historically, this was referencing the king of Assyria. We're going to see later that the king of Assyria is actually another picture of Lucifer. But within this message, within this passage, the Lord is also talking about those top three beings. Again, they are his nemesis. And he finally says, I'm done with you. You're not going to get what you deserve. So what have we learned? The unholy trinity. So there is a counterpart to the holy trinity. And the holy trinity is composed of the devil, the antichrist, and the false prophet. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to go through and we're going to specifically look at each one of those three. We're going to scripturally lay out how are all of them characterized, what is their purpose, who are they, what is their position within the demonic kingdom. And if we're going to do that, we got to start with the top guy, the dragon, also known as the devil, and Lucifer. So let's go back to Isaiah 27.1. In that day, the Lord will punish Leviathan, the fleeing serpent, with his fierce and great and mighty sword, even Leviathan, the twisted serpent, and he will kill the dragon who lives in the sea. So we've seen this passage. Revelation 13, 1 says, And the dragon stood on the sand of the, sea, of the seashore. So we're seeing this image of Lucifer being used repeatedly throughout Scripture. Revelation 12, 9. And the great dragon was thrown down, the serpent of old, who is called the devil and Satan. So again, we see who this dragon is. Revelation 22, we've seen this one. And he laid hold of the dragon, the serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan. 
and bound him for a thousand years. So scripture is specifically telling us the meaning of this image of the dragon. It's the devil. Now within scripture, there are three portraits of Lucifer in the Old Testament. So Revelation is characterizing him as a dragon, and actually Isaiah did too. And throughout scripture, the devil is given many different names or many images are represented. Just like Jesus, there's so many pictures and so many descriptions of who Jesus is. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the bread of life. I am the word made life. So just like there's lots of descriptions of the Lord, there's also a lot of descriptions of his nemesis, the devil. So the first picture is the king of Babylon. And what we're going to see is that the king of Babylon is a religious leader. Next will be the king of Tyre, and his domain is, is an economic leader. And lastly, Assyria, who is a military leader. Each of those three pictures gives this portrait of Lucifer in a different part of his entity and also his big kingdom. So we're going to begin with Babylon. Isaiah 14, 3 through 11 says this, And it will be in the day when the Lord gives you rest from your pain and turmoil and harsh service in which you have been enslaved, that you will take up this taunt against the king of Babylon. I like this. We're going to taunt the king of Babylon and say how the oppressor has ceased and how fury has ceased. The Lord has broken the staff of the wicked, and the scepter of rulers, which used to strike the peoples in fury, with unceasing strokes, which subdued the nations in anger with unrestrained persecution. The whole earth is at rest and is quiet. They break forth into shouts of joy. Even the cypress trees rejoice over you and the cedars of Lebanon, saying, Since you were laid low, no tree cutter comes up against us. Sheol from beneath is excited over you to meet you when you come. It arouses for you the spirits of the dead, all the leaders of the earth. It raises all the kings of the nations from their thrones. They will all respond and say to you, even you have been made weak as we. You have become like us. Your pomp and the music of your harps have been brought down to Sheol. Maggots are spread out as your bed beneath you and worms are your covering. Not a pretty sight. So the highlighted words, uh, Sheol, clearly that's Hebrew word for help, when it talks about the trees, there's a reason for that because the tree of knowledge is a picture of Lucifer. And we see that great tree keep showing up. So when the king of Babylon is described as a great tree, which we see in Daniel, that's where this reference to trees comes in. Now, we're also going to see that with the king of Assyria in just a little bit. So that's why I'm highlighting that. So you can see that the language and the images line up between all three of these portraits. So let's look at the second half of the passage from Isaiah. This is Isaiah 14, 12 through 21. How you have fallen from heaven. Oh, and I put Lucifer because many translations actually put Lucifer. The one that I'm using doesn't, but I, I included it because I do believe that's who's being referenced, and that's why other versions show that also. So it says, How you have fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, star of the morning, son of the dawn. You have been cut down to the earth. So again, talking about a tree being cut down. You who have weakened the nations, but you said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God, and I will sit on the mount of assembly in the recesses of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. Nevertheless, you will be thrust down to Sheol, to the recesses of the pit. Those who see you will gaze at you. They will ponder over you, saying, Is this the man who made the earth tremble, who shook kingdoms, who made the world like a wilderness and overthrew its cities, who did not allow his prisoners to go home? All the kings of the nations lie in glory, each in his own tomb. But you have been cast out of your tomb like a rejected branch, clothed with the slain, who are pierced with the sword, who go down to the stones of the pit, like a trampled corpse. You will not be united with them in burial. 
because you have ruined your country. You have slain your people. May the offspring of evildoers not be mentioned forever. Prepare for his sons a place of slaughter because of the iniquity of their fathers. They must not arise and take possession of the earth and fill the face of the world with cities. Again, it's just not a good picture for this being. And I want to look at the highlighted uh, sections again. So it says, I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. So one of the images in scripture is that the stars of heaven are an image of the angels. That's something, again, that the Old, refer the Old Testament references. So Lucifer wants to raise himself above the angels. He wants to be like God. He says, I will sit on the mount of assembly. So I'm assuming that's where God sits. It says, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. I will make myself like God. And then God says, oh, no, 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 no. You will be thrust down to Sheol, hell, into the recesses of the pit. And the pit is another picture of hell, which we see later on. Uh, he'll be sent down to the pit like a trampled corpse. So highlighted these to make special points, but also as we're going to see in the other passages about Lucifer as the king of Assyria and as the king of Tyre, that the same statements are made, which is why we can see it's the same being being talked about. All right, so the dragon is Babylon. The king of Babylon desires more than anything to be worshipped. And we know that from looking at the rest of the book of Daniel. The king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, set up a great image of himself, required everybody, including Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, to worship him. That was his first call of order. He wanted to be worshipped and adored. He, uh, so, again, we're looking at um, Nebuchadnezzar. He creates an image of himself to be worshipped by the children of God on pain of death. That's Daniel 3, 8 through 30. This prefigures the great tribulation in Revelation and the endurance of the saints. Because if you remember from Revelation 13, the false prophet will also create a false image of the Antichrist and will require the whole earth to worship that image. So we're seeing the king of Babylon as a religious figure. That is one of the key pieces of Lucifer, his goals, his dreams, and his entire kingdom. And it comes first. First of all, he wants to be worshipped like God. That is his heart's desire. So the three portraits of Lucifer in the Old Testament. First one is Babylon religious leader. So just cover that one. The second one is Tyre, who we're going to see as an economic leader. And then lastly is Syria, the military leader. So let's look at Tyre. This is from Ezekiel 28, 1 through 11. The word of the Lord came again to me, saying, Son of man, say to the leader of Tyre, Thus says the Lord God, because your heart is lifted up, and you have said, I am a God. I sit in the seat of gods in the heart of the seat. Yea, you are a man and not God, although you make your heart like the heart of God. Behold, you are wiser than Daniel. There is no secret that is a match for you. By your wisdom and understanding, you have acquired riches for yourself and have acquired gold and silver for your treasuries. By your great wisdom, by your trade, you have increased your riches and your heart is lifted up because of your riches. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, because you have made your heart like the heart of God, therefore, behold, I will bring strangers upon you, the most ruthless of the nations, and they will draw their swords against the beauty of your wisdom and defile your splendor. They will bring you down to the pits, and you will die the death of those who are slain in the heart of the seas. Will you still say, I am a God, in the presence of your slayer, though you are a man and not God, in the hands of those who would wound you? You will die the death of the uncircumcised by the hand of strangers. For I have spoken, declares the Lord God. Again, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, take up a lamentation over the king of Tyre and say to him, Thus says the Lord God. So if you remember from the last passage of Babylon, we were going to taunt the king of Babylon. 
This one says you're to do a lamentation over the king of Babylon. And if you look at the highlighted pieces, his heart is lifted up. He says, I am a God. I sit in the seat of gods. He makes his heart like the heart of God. He says, I am a God. And yet he doesn't learn. He gets thrown into the pit. He goes to hell. So the language perfectly mirrors what we saw for the king of Babylon. And then I highlighted in red where it says the heart of the seas because seven times in the, I'm sorry, six times in the passages about the king of Tyre, it's uh, Ezekiel, I think it's 26, 27, 28. The phrase the heart of the seas is used six times. So again, if we're saying that his home, Lucifer's home, is in the seas, this is referencing that as well. All right, so this is Ezekiel 28, 12 through 19. It says, you had the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering, the ruby, the topaz, and the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, and the jasper, the lapis lazuli, the turquoise, and the emerald, and the gold. The workmanship of your settings and sockets was in you. On the day that you were created, they were prepared. You were the anointed cherub who covers, and I placed you there. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked in the midst of the stones of fire. You were blameless in your ways from the day you were created until unrighteousness was found in you. By the abundance of your trade, you were internally filled with violence, and you sinned. Therefore, I have cast you as profane from the mountain of God, and I have destroyed you, O covering cherub. In the midst of the stones of fire. Your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom by reason of your splendor. I cast you to the ground. I put you before kings that they may see you. By the multitude of your iniquities and the unrighteousness of your trade, you profaned your sanctuaries. Therefore, I have brought fire from the midst of you. It has consumed you, and I have turned you to ashes on the earth in the eyes of all who see you. All who know you among the peoples are appalled at you. You have become terrified, and you will cease to be forever. Again, it's just not a, not a pretty picture for what the end game is. And looking at the passage, it says, just like he did in Babylon, that he's going to be laid low, that all the people of the earth are going to look at him and go, who are you? Um, he's going to be humiliated says that he was in Eden, he was the anointed cherub who covers, he was on the holy mountain of God. So it's referencing him before his fall, just like it said, oh, uh, Lucifer, uh, son of the dawn. It's talking about him in Eden. And then, of course, in the end, his heart was lifted up because of his beauty. He became full of pride, and he fell, and God then destroys him for his sin. So the king of Tyre accumulates immeasurable wealth through trade. The rest of the world laments at his destruction because their fortune is lost with him. And we're definitely going to see that later on in the book of Revelation. And he lives in the heart of the seas. And as I've said, if you look at the passages, you can see how they mirror each other. All right, so a little special something, something. It says that he lives in the heart of the seas. The term heart of the seas is used six times in the passages about the king of Tyre. That's found in Ezekiel chapters 26, 27, and 28. Scripture records one other use of this term a seventh time in the book of Jonah. So in the entire Bible, from Genesis 1-1, Revelation 22, I think 21, could be 22-22, whole Bible, that term part of the seas is used exactly seven times. Six times in the passages referencing the king of Tyre, and one time in the book of Jonah. So we're going to talk more about Jonah later, but I, I'm setting that up. We'll come back to that. So we're looking at those three portraits of Lucifer in the Old Testament. We've looked at the first one, King of Babylon, religious leader. 
We've looked at the second one, king of Tyre, and economic leader. Now the third one is the king of Syria. We see him as a military leader. This is Ezekiel 31, 3 through 12. Behold, Assyria was a cedar in Lebanon with beautiful branches and forest shape, and very high, and its top was among the clouds. So, we'll stop there. As we go through this passage, the king of Assyria is portrayed as a huge tree. And if you remember from Daniel, the king of Babylon had a dream that he was a huge tree that covered the earth. So now we're seeing this tree, and it sets its top among the clouds. Remember we talked about that in Babylon, the Lucifer ascended to the heights of the clouds or tried to. All right, so it says, The waters made it grow, the deep made it high. With its rivers, it continually extended all around its planting place and sent out its channels to all the trees of the field. So there's that image of the trees that was first started in Babylon. It says, therefore, its height was loftier than all the trees of the field, and its boughs became many, and its branches long, because of many waters as it spread them out. All the birds of the heavens nested in its boughs, and under its branches all the beasts of the field gave birth. And all great nations lived under its shade. So it was beautiful in its greatness, and the length of its branches, for its roots extended to many waters. The cedars in God's garden could not match it. The cypresses could not compare with its boughs, and the plane trees could not match its branches. No tree in God's garden could compare with it in its beauty. I made it beautiful with the multitude of its branches, and all the trees of Eden, which were in the garden of God, were jealous of it. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, because it is high in stature and it set its top among the clouds, and its heart is haughty in its loftiness. Therefore, I will give it into the hand of a despot of the nations. He will thoroughly deal with it according to its wickedness. I have driven it away. Alien tyrants of the nations have cut it down and left it on the mountains, and in all the valleys its branches have fallen, and its boughs have been broken in all the ravines of the land. So, for the third time, we see this image that this great, beautiful, tremendous being seeks to be the top, seeps the, the top of the clouds. And yet, because it lifted up its heart, God is going to cut it down to the ground. This is the rest of the passage uh, of Ezekiel chapter 28, verses 13 through 18. And all the peoples of the earth have gone down from its shade and left it. On its ruin, all the birds of the heavens will dwell and all the beasts of the field will be on its fallen branches, so that all the trees by the waters may not be exalted in their stature, nor set their top among the clouds, nor their well-watered mighty ones stand erect in their height. For they have all been given over to death, to the earth beneath, among the sons of men, with those who go down to the pit. Thus says the Lord God, on the day when it went down to Sheol, I caused lamentations. I closed the deep over it and held back its rivers, and its many waters were stopped up. And I made Lebanon mourn for it, and all the trees of the field wilted away on account of it. I made the nations quake at the sound of its fall, when I made it go down to Sheol with those who go down to the pit, and all the well-watered trees of Eden, the choicest and best of Lebanon, were comforted in the earth beneath. They also went down with it to Sheol, to those who were slain by the sword. And those who were at strength lived under its shade among the nations. To which among the trees of Eden are you thus equal in glory and greatness? Yet you will be brought down with the trees of Eden to the earth beneath. You will lie in the midst of the uncircumcised with those who were slain by the sword. So we see the ultimate fate of this great being. He goes to the pit, he goes to Sheol. He's cut down to the earth, he, he's destroyed forever. So the king of Assyria is seen throughout the Old Testament as a military leader who is always a threat to Israel. 
The image of the tree is different from Babylon and Tyre, but is another manifestation of the tree of the knowledge and the tree in Daniel's vision of the king of Babylon. So what I'm saying there is that the king of Babylon and the king of Tyre were seen as kings. In, um, in Ezekiel's passage, we see the king portrayed as a tree, but it's still, it's the same portrait. And you can see how the language continues to line up. So all three describe Lucifer in the Garden of Eden. All three describe his arrogance and desire to elevate himself. All three describe his downfall. All three describe his imprisonment in hell. All three kingdoms are seen combined into one final kingdom on earth during the Great Tribulation. So what we see in the Old Testament, we see those three pictures of Lucifer. In the New Testament, in the book of Revelation, we see a final kingdom that's called Babylon the Great. And in that last kingdom, we see all three of those different aspects all wrapped up into one. One kingdom with three faces of religion, commerce, and war. And that's called Babylon the Great. So Babylon represents sacrilegious worship. Tyre, great wealth, and Assyria, war. So Babylon, again, it's sacrilegious worship. It's worship of a false god. Revelation 13, 14, and 15 says this, And he deceives those who dwell on the earth because of the signs which it was given him to perform in the presence of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who had the wound of the sword and has come to life, and it was given to him to give breath to the image of the beast, so that the image of the beast would even speak and cause as many as do not worship the image of the beast to be killed. So the saints of God will be, it will be demanded of them to worship a false god. That is represented through Babylon. Now Tyre says it talks about in Revelation 18, 9 through 13. And this passage is basically almost lifted word for word from Ezekiel when it's talking about the king of Tyre. It says, and the kings of the earth who committed acts of immorality and lived sensuously with her will weep and lament. Remember that lamentation over the king of Tyre? So they will weep and lament over her when they see the smoke of her burning standing at a great distance because of the fear of her torment, saying, Woe, woe, the great city Babylon, the strong city, for in one hour your judgment has come, and the merchants of the earth weep and mourn over her, because no one buys their cargoes anymore, cargoes of gold and silver and precious stones and pearls and fine linen and purple and silk and scarlet, and every kind of citron wood and every article of ivory, Every article made from very costly wood and bronze and iron and marble and cinnamon and spice and incense and perfume and frankincense and wine and olive oil and fine flour and wheat and cattle and sheep and cargoes of horses and chariots and slaves and human lives. So we see that the great kings of the earth, that they become wealthy by being associated with and supporting the the Antichrist, and that shown as great wealth, which we saw in the King of Tyre. So lastly, we see war. This is Revelation 16, 13, and 14. And I saw coming out of the mouth of the dragon, and out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet, three unclean spirits like frogs, for they are spirits of demons, performing signs which go out to the kings of the whole world to gather them together for the war of the great day of God, the Almighty. So again, Babylon the Great is the last kingdom described in the book of Revelation. It's seen as equally being a part of Babylon. Babylon portrays uh, Babylon the Great later on, the religious piece. Tyre represents the economic piece, and Assyria, the war. All three of those are aspects of that last great kingdom. And it's not a good one. 
It's definitely the kingdom of the enemy. It is in opposition to the children of God. So the dragon, another picture of the dragon is the great mountain. So this is the last big image we're going to look at for Lucifer. So the, the image of the great mountain, the symbol transitions from a person to a place to a thing. When you watch it throughout the Old Testament, it's the same entity, it's the same being. It's Lucifer, but the image changes from, like it says, a person to a place to a thing. So the great mountain first is a person. You have to look at um, the original patriarchs. Abraham was a type of God the Father. When you say type, there were things about Abraham that portrayed a bigger image, that portrayed somebody different. So Abraham was the father of all the Jews. Right? And the spiritual father of the church. So he is a type of God the Father, who is the father of all. Isaac was a type of Jesus. Abraham tried to sacrifice Isaac. And that was portraying the eventual sacrifice in the cross that God the Father did through Jesus, or had Jesus be sacrificed. Esau was a type of the devil. He forfeited his name and his birthright, and his descendants became enemies of God's children. So, of course, there's there's one figure here that's missing, and that's Jacob. Jacob's definitely a type of somebody, but we're going to cover that later. But it's very clear and easy to see who Abraham's a type of, God the Father, Isaac a type of Jesus. Isaac had twin boys. Jacob is one. But Esau was the one who was rejected because he forfeited his name, forfeit his birthright. What did the devil do? When the devil lifted his heart on high and wanted to be like God, he was giving up his name, his position, his birthright. He sacrificed that. And his descendants then, or the people who followed him, became the enemies of God's children. And that's why we see Esau as a type of the devil. That's the beginning point. Now we're going to watch that image grow and change. So the great mountain, and we're going to see that the person, or the image goes from the person to the place. So the image of Lucifer as Esau is going to change from a person now to a place. Esau lived in the hill country of Sire. Esau is Edom. So the Edomites were the people who became enemies of the Jews, and they lived around Mount Sire. Esau originally settled in Mount Sire, and the people who settled there were his descendants. So you see the image of Esau as a person, then gets transformed into a place. And Esau represents Lucifer, so Lucifer as Esau gets now becomes Lucifer a place, Edom, in the hill country of Sire. Sire was a mountain. Then Genesis 36, 9 says, These then are the records of the generations of Esau, the father of the Edomites in the hill country of Sair. Ezekiel 35, 15 says, You will be a desolation, O Mount Sair, and all of Edom, all of it. They will know that I am the Lord. So we see that there is a condemnation being brought against Mount Sair and the Edomites, who are the descendants of Esau, who is a picture of the devil. Now, the great mountains again going to transition, this time from a place to a thing. Behold, I am against you, Mount Sire, and I will stretch out my hand against you and make you a desolation and a waste. Ezekiel 35, 1. And this is Obadiah. So the entire book of Obadiah, it's one chapter, 21 verses, the entire book is about Mount Sinai and the Edomites. So it says, the vision of Obadiah, thus says the Lord God concerning Edom, we have heard a report from the Lord and an envoy has been sent among the nations saying, arise and let us go against her for battle. Behold, I will make you small among the nations. You are greatly despised. The arrogance of your heart has deceived you, you who live in the clefts of the rock. 
in the loftiness of your dwelling place who say in your heart, who will bring me down to earth? Though you build high like the eagle, you set your nest among the stars. From there I will bring you down, declares the Lord. If thieves came to you, if robbers by night, oh, how you will be ruined. Would they not steal only until they had enough? If grape gatherers came to you, would they not leave some gleanings? So if you remember, this passage is mirroring the other three portraits of Lucifer in the Old Testament. His heart is lifted up. He sets his place on high, right? And he sets it among the stars. Remember, among the stars of heaven. But he's going to be ruined. So this is Obadiah 1, 6 through 11. Oh, how Esau will be ransacked and his hidden treasures searched out. All the men allied with you, you will send will, with you, will send you forth to the border, and the men at peace with you will deceive you and overpower you. They who eat your bread will set an ambush for you. Will I not on that day, declares the Lord, destroy wise men from Edom and understanding from the mountain of Esau? Then your mighty men will be dismayed, O Teman, so that everyone may be cut off from the mountain of Esau by slaughter. Because of violence to your brother Jacob, you will be covered with shame and you will be cut off forever. On the day that you stood aloof, on the day that strangers carried off his wealth and foreigners entered his gate and cast lots for Jerusalem, you too were as one of them. So the indictment against Esau, against Lucifer, is that he stands by and watches God's children. His brother, remember Jacob and Esau were brothers, he's going to watch the children of Jacob be destroyed. He's going to stand by and do nothing. Let it happen. And then Obadiah 1, 11 through 16 says, Do not gloat over your brother's day, the day of his misfortune, and do not rejoice over the sons of Judah in the day of their destruction. Yes, do not boast in the day of their distress. Do not enter the gate of my people in the day of their disaster. Yes, you do not gloat over their calamity in the day of their disaster, and do not loot their wealth in the day of their disaster. Do not stand at the fork of the road to cut down their fugitives, and do not imprison their survivors in the day of their distress. For the day of the Lord draws near on all the nations. As you have done, it will be done to you. Your dealings will return on your own head, because just as you drank on my holy mountain, all the nations will drink continually. So again, we're seeing that Esau, or the leader of Esau, picturing Lucifer, was on the holy mountain of God. We saw that earlier in the other passages about Lucifer. We're getting close to wrapping this up. It says, They will drink and swallow and become as if they had never existed. But on Mount Zion, there will be those who escape, and it will be holy, and the house of Jacob will possess their possessions. Then the house of Jacob will be a fire, and the house of Joseph a flame, but the house of Esau will be a stubble, and they will set them on fire and consume them, so that there will be no survivor of the house of Esau. For the Lord has spoken. Then the house of Negev will possess the mountain of Esau, and those of the Shephala, the Philistine plain, also possess the territory of Ephraim and the territory of Samaria, and Benjamin will possess Gilead. And the exiles of this host of the sons of Israel, who are among the Canaanites as far as Zarephath, and the exiles of Jerusalem, who are in Sepharad, will possess the cities of the Negev. The deliverers will ascend Mount Zion to judge the mountain of Esau, and the kingdom will be the Lord's. All right, Jeremiah 51, 25 says, Behold, I am against you, O destroying mountain, who destroys the whole earth, declares the Lord. And I will stretch out my hand against you and roll you down from the crags, and I will make you a burnt out mountain. So this mountain just keeps getting more massive, and it covers the whole earth. And Jeremiah describes it as a destroying mountain, and then later says it is a burnt-out mountain. So picture the burnt-out mountain, because we see it in Revelation 8, 8, and 9. 
The second angel sounded, and something like a great mountain, burning with fire, was thrown into the sea. And a third of the sea became blood, and a third of the creatures which were in the sea and had life died, and a third of the ships were destroyed. So, the Old Testament tells us the meaning, tells us the personality, tells us the identity of who this great mountain with burning with fire is. It's not rep meant to represent a physical burning mountain. It's representing Lucifer. So when we read the passage in Revelation, Scripture has informed us who we're really talking about. So, what have we learned? We've been looking at the dragon, a.k.a. better known as Lucifer, the head of the demonic kingdom. And in the Old Testament, there were three portraits of who Lucifer is, or who Lucifer was. First of all, is the king of Babylon, who was seen as a religious leader. The whole goal of the king of Babylon was he wanted all the world to worship him. And first and foremost, that's what Lucifer wants. Secondly, we see him as the king of Tyre, who was an economic leader who basically hoarded everything for himself. He was wealthy beyond belief. And lastly, the king of Assyria, a milita military leader who just wanted to conquer everything. And of course, then once you're conquered, you take their wealth and you get them to bow down and worship you. So we see that all three of those fit together. And they don't want to forget the Great Mountain. A little different take, but nonetheless, another picture of who Lucifer is. So Babylon the Great in Revelation. So that is another kingdom. It is the final evolution of Lucifer's kingdom, which combines the characteristics of the three previous kingdoms. So it's actually not something new. It's the final evolution of what Lucifer has been building for thousands of years. In scripture, we see it symbolically or we see the image of Babylon the Great. In real time, in, uh, you know, historically, we see it as the final evolution of the Roman Empire. So scripture is pointing towards the final Roman Empire, the final version of it that we're going to see. Well, we've looked long and hard and seen what scripture has to tell us. That's all I have to say about Lucifer for now, but that's not the end of his kingdom. We also need to take a look at the spirit beings behind the Antichrist, behind the false prophet, and also how does scripture portray the rest of the demonic kingdom. That's it for today. Looking forward to seeing you next time.